see in high abundance there is the wood metal. And then here's some prairies. Uh, about 99% of our prairies are currently in the alternate state of cornfields, uh, but we have hope that someday they'll go back to being real prairies with <coughs> 400 species of plants that they should have. So, what's the difference between a boreal forest and a temperate forest? What is it about the climate that determines which one of those two forest types we have? Uh, one thing, of course, is if it's so cold in the winter that it kills temperate species, then they just can't grow there and it's going to be boreal forests. So during the polar vortex uh, outbreak of 2019, we had a, a reading of minus 56 two days in a row at a small town called Cotton, Minnesota. And I went there afterwards and looked if I could find any maple trees and guess what? I couldn't find a single one. Um, they can't survive temperatures like that. However, as the winter minimums rise, and they're doing that really fast, we think that mean summer temperature is going to be a more important factor in determining whether you have boreal or temperate forest. So this is the work of one of my PhD students, Nick Fizikelli, who's now at, um, at the, the um, Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park. And he visited all sorts of sites that have temperate and boreal trees mixed together from warm sites that are almost all temperate and maybe just one or two fir trees to cold sites that are almost all boreal species and just a few maples. And he found that if you look at the, the growth rates of the saplings, there's a crossover point. So the boreal saplings grow more, uh, balsam fir and white spruce are shown here when you have cooler mean summer temperatures, so it would be June, July, and August mean temperature, when that gets down around 63 degrees, the boreal species are going to grow faster. And then there's a crossover point around 64 and a half. And then as you get warmer than that, the temperate trees will grow more. So what can happen is um, if it warms from one side of this gradient from 63, mean summer temperature up to 66, then uh, temperate species would be able to displace the boreal species. They would grow faster, be better competitors. And then here's the prairie forest border. What is it that determines whether there's any forest at all, whether it's temperate or boreal versus grasslands? Well, another one of my PhD students, Nick Dons, who's now at the University of Wisconsin, um, looked at that for his PhD topic and you see the original forest and prairie there on the left in Minnesota and the, the prairie forest border cuts across the state diagonally from northwest to southeast and it turned out that it's the annual water balance so if you look at the map on the right the green and blue areas have a positive water balance in other words more rainfall than evaporation and those areas support forest. The brown areas have more evaporation than rainfall and they support prairies. Uh, so then the question is, well, here's just a summary of that. So again, for the temperate versus boreal, it's a, it's a mean summer temperature gradient that determines which one's gonna dominate. And, and for the prairie forest border, it's this climatic moisture index uh, where if there's an excess of water, you get forest, and if there's a deficit of water, you get prairie. So what happens if you put this on a map? So we did that. Uh, and the map you see on the left is the current biome distribution using those exact rules applied to every square kilometer across this region, uh, including Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. You see the prairie has now moved off way to the west. Uh, Iowa is no longer a prairie state. It now has a forest climate because in the early uh, period of, of warming climate, most of it occurred in the winter. Summers have not warmed up very much and we have an increase of several inches per year in mean rainfall. So it's actually a wetter climate. Iowa is now a forest state instead of a prairie state. Um, then looking at the other colors there, the darkest color is the boreal, and you see that going into northeastern Minnesota. 
and then there's a minty green color that's mixed boreal and temperate, and then the yellowish is the broadleaf or the temperate deciduous forest. So that's what the climates that support those vegetation types look like right now. Uh, and here in the Adirondacks and in the lower elevations, it's going to be in that minty green color, the mixed boreal temperate. So what happens for future climate scenarios for a low scenario where we're, we're successful at really reducing CO2 emissions, everything stays almost the same. It moves just a little bit to the north. You would still recognize Minnesota as being Minnesota. Um, whereas with the high, which is business as usual or RCP eight and a half, whatever you want to call it, uh, the prairie forest border moves off 300 miles to the east and the boreal leaves the area completely um, all three states and this would apply to New England as well pretty much the same situation here and you see that Minnesota there is 90 percent the brown color which is prairie um, and this is where I got into big trouble when I was interviewed by a Washington Post reporter and he said what do you think about the possibility of all that prairie in Minnesota and I, my answer was we have a perfectly good Kansas now and we don't need a second Kansas in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> and that turned that ended up being in the, the lead sentence in the article on the front page of the Washington Post. <laughs> um, and this is when you find out what feedback really means. <laughs> so I got emails from all over the world. Um, telling me how brilliant I was and telling me how stupid I was. <laughs> uh, on average, I guess, I, I'm okay. <laughs> so that's a huge difference. And as we'll see in a minute, that would propagate all along the southern boreal from Edmonton, Alberta, all the way out to Labrador. And I'll show some maps in a, in a few minutes of that. So that's a, a real problem for maintaining forests. So one way to look at it is to find an area that's boreal forest right now and ask the question, where is a place that right now has a summer that's several degrees warmer, but has the same physiography? So the blue star is boreal forest in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in Northern Minnesota. The orange star is Granite Falls, Minnesota. So the, the summer temperature there is a lot warmer, but there's granite in both places in shallow soils. So here's what the Boundary Waters looks like. So this is black spruce forest growing on 2.8 billion year old granite. And here is nice outcrops natural area near Granite Falls, Minnesota. And the only difference here is it's four degrees Celsius or about seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer mean summer temperature. The, the type of rock is the same. This is a little bit older rock. This is 3.6 billion year old rock here. Minnesota is a really old place um, in <laughs> case you didn't already know that. Um, but the same physiography and you get oak trees with, with some prairie in between just by warming up the summer climate. Uh, by about seven degrees Fahrenheit. So we know that if we go on a business as usual CO2 scenario, it's going to wipe out approximately the southernmost 300 miles of the boreal forest. And the question is, what else is going to make that happen? What's going to push that along? Uh, are there other factors in addition to just uh, good old temperature uh, and water balance? Well, here are seven ways that the that the um, warming climate can kill the boreal forest. And I published a paper of that title recently. The first is gap dynamics and gradual replacement. Uh, if the summers get warm enough that temperate saplings grow really well, then they can fill in the gaps as the older boreal trees die in old uneven aged forests. And places like this, this is Oberg Mountain in Northern Minnesota. And you see the temperate forest in the red there. It's a fall color photograph. That's all sugar maple. And then in the lower elevations, you see boreal forests. So 
if the summer's warming, the temperate saplings would be able to grow under the boreal trees and gradually replace them. And they're mixed together like this throughout the landscape, so it would be easy for that to happen. And here's an example of a place I visited in 1979. <coughs> it was all boreal at that time, and I revisited in 2016. You see a sugar maple there on the right. Uh, no longer quite cool enough to maintain pure boreal dominance. So next is a trophic cascade um, with a delay before the temperate trees can grow. And this is caused by deer. So the crossover point for the mean summer temperature, which will give you boreal versus temperate, is displaced upwards by deer because they eat the temperate seedlings. So it might be the best climate for them, but they can't grow because the deer eat them preferentially over the spruce and fir of the boreal forest. So this could cause a delay of the forest in response to rising temperatures, followed by a sudden snap um, to a new alternate state. This is red oak in northern Minnesota, eaten by deer uh, at least 15 years in a row. Uh, deer and moose browse the temperate species more than boreal. Um, as I said, and furthermore, deer are unevenly spread over the landscape because of wolves. So these red splotches you see here, each one of those is a wolf pack territory. And deer may not be the smartest animal that ever lived, but they know not to live in the middle of a wolf pack territory. <laughs> so they move out into the interstitial areas in between the wolf pack territories so you have some areas where just the plain old temperature difference that I explained a few slides ago can cause transition to temperate forest uh, very rapidly, and that's in those wolf pack territories. And then you have areas where the deer populations are really high, and they're eating the temperate seedlings and preventing them from taking over and preventing the forest from adjusting to a warming climate. And we have lots of wolves. We have like 2,500 of them in Minnesota. And I, I think they only have 800 in Michigan or something like that. Um, wind and hail storms. Here's the big blowdown of 1999 in the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota. Was a derecho. It uh, was about 10 miles wide, 10 to 12 miles wide. And it went. Uh, all the way across the Boundary Waters, about 400,000 acres of forest were leveled. Um, 120 mile an hour winds for 20 minutes as the storm passed by a given place and seven inches of rain in that amount of time. And that's what it looks like after the blowdown. A whole landscape that looks like Paul Bunyan came in there with a big lawnmower. Uh, but there's still a lot of green there because all the suppressed seedlings like fir and spruce in this boreal forest are still under there. Still a boreal forest, it's just a, a boreal forest of small stature. And there we are walking around after the blowdown. The big 200 year old trees are all laying on the ground, but all those small spruce and fir are now free to grow, but it's still a boreal forest. But if you warm up the mean summer temperature and you get an understory of red maple, which you see here in red, underneath that boreal forest, and then the wind blows it down, it's an instant transition from one biome to another. Um, next is wind followed by fire. So we get big fires in Minnesota, 100,000 acres is not unusual. Uh, and here is an old red pine, black spruce forest, uh, two, over 200 years old. There it is after the blowdown. And now you've got 100 tons per acre of dried windfall slash fuel. And guess what happens if that ignites? That is what happens. Um, and what happens is it exterminates the pine. All the pine cones of the jack pine are down on the ground in the fire instead of just being scorched up in the canopy. The seedlings of the spruce and fir are on the forest floor. They are consumed by the fire. The seed bank is consumed by the fire. It's, so, it's like a crown fire sitting on the surface of the soil. Everything is consumed. And what happens is the upper picture there, birch and aspen take over. So it 
instantly converts the forest to from a conifer forest to a birch aspen forest. So you can wind plus fire means major transformation. If the temperatures are cool enough, it might stay uh, boreal. It might be you might get um, aspen and birches boreal, uh, but if it's warm enough, you might get oaks and maples. And we're seeing a little bit of that even near the Canadian border in the Boundary Waters. That red maple is invading a lot of places on the landscape, being present in the understory, so it can be released from suppression after wind or sprout from the root system or the stump after a fire. Next is heat and drought stress. This is a birch forest in northern Minnesota that died after three or four years in a row of severe drought. Um, this is widespread further west in Saskatchewan and Alberta. It's starting to happen in Minnesota. Insect infestation, both native and exotic. For example, mountain pine beetle is killed by minus 40. And as you know, in the Western United States, it doesn't get that cold anymore. So they have these huge infestations that killed tens of millions of acres of lodgepole pine. Uh, we did some research and discovered that our jack pine is equally susceptible uh, as lodgepole pine to this beetle. It just has to come across Saskatchewan and Manitoba to make it to Minnesota without encountering minus 40. Right now, that would be a pretty tall order. I mean, we rarely have a winter that's not colder than minus 40 in Minnesota. This winter, it only got down to minus 39, and we thought that was a mild winter. <laughs> so if it's minus 45, it's average, and if the minimum is minus 55, it's a cold winter. So, but winters are getting warmer fast, and it could be that in 10 years, we'll no longer get the minus 40, and the beetle will come to Minnesota. And once it gets here, it won't have any trouble running all the way to the East Coast once you get into these mild climates. And last is phenological disturbance. This is a new concept. Um, in March of 2012, there were 15,000 record highs. Um, in the United States, the jet stream did that weird thing with the big ridge, with the the red there, we had magnolias in bloom in March in, in Minnesota, which is ridiculous. Uh, and what happened to the boreal forest in northern Minnesota when you apply an 80 degree temperature at mid-March? Well, this is what happened. <laughs> On the upper, you see balsam fir and jack pine that have turned brown, and the lower is, is miles and miles of brown spruce forest near Thunder Bay, Ontario. They came out of dormancy too early. And then froze later, ironically, even though boreal tree species are the most cold resistant trees in the world. So if we, these trees did recover, but if we had two springs in a row like this, they wouldn't have enough energy to put out new foliage and you could literally wipe out all the conifers from Minnesota all the way to the Atlantic Ocean in, in one fell swoop. And we're really worried that this is gonna be the main event, which is coming sometime in the next couple of decades. So all these mechanisms are, operate across large areas. Only one of them is gradual. The others all cause sudden transitions over areas of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of acres in size. So these boreal forests like you see here in the Boundary Waters Wilderness, um, there's lots of different mechanisms that could kill any one acre of forest. Uh, and a lot of them will operate at the same time. So here's the, the continent-wide analysis. The heavy black line that you see is the southern margin of the boreal. And there's the northern margin. And it should all be that light green color like there. This shows what part would be converted to grasslands from northern Minnesota all the way up to to uh, Edmonton and beyond, almost all the way up to Yellowknife. And from Eastern Minnesota out to the Atlantic Ocean, all of that would be converted to temperate forest. And that means the existing boreal forest would die. And that's an area, well, two and a half times the size of Japan. I just gave this seminar at Hokkaido University. I forgot to correct it. It's also five times the size of Minnesota. So um, that's a huge area 
uh, for us that could die with the business as usual scenario and be a tipping point. In fact, the Southern Boreal is shown as a tipping point in the latest IPCC report and in some prominent journal articles. And that would be a lot of carbon to go in the atmosphere and then we would no longer have control. So starting to transition to, to um, Bill Muma's talk here, what are we going to do to stop climate change, keep all intact forests, restore commercial forests with close to nature forestry practices that I believe will sequester more carbon, let forests get older and reforest deforested areas. These are intact forests in the dark green color. Most of the Amazon, most of Canada, a lot of Siberia are still intact forests. Uh, the gold shows the total area of forest in the world. So there's still a lot of intact forest out there to be protected. And if you look at tree cover in the world, you find that there's about 2.2 billion acres, which is the size of the United States or 6% of the, the surface of the world that has a climate that right now would support forested, but isn't forested and, and is not needed for agriculture. And planting a trillion trees on those 2.2 billion acres would be about 125 seedlings per person globally. And if we did that in the next decade or two, from 2040 to 2100, those trees would really be sucking in the carbon dioxide and the world is really going to need it at that time. And globally, we're in a race to reforest large acreages before the climate reduces the area with suitable climate for forests. Um, so that we don't lose our existing forest because, like I just showed for the southern boreal, if the climate will no longer support forests. <clears throat> so our project at the University of Minnesota is green again Madagascar. You see the purple there is the original rainforest of Madagascar. Our project is by the star there. Um, 7,000 species of plants found nowhere else on, on Earth. And so we started this project called Green Again, and we're growing 58 species of native trees, 20 of which don't even have a scientific name yet, but we're using the name the local people call them. And um, we employ 80 people there um, through Green Again Madagascar, which is a 501c3. And here you see some of them on the way to a planting site with a boatload of seedlings. And it's always important to have local knowledge plant the right tree in the right place. This is our local knowledge in Madagascar. Um, so I hope that these planting projects will proliferate. This is on plant for the planet. They have sites all over the world on plant for the planet website. And you can click on any one of the dots and, and see what they're doing there uh, for all these planting projects, which we hope will help us get ahead of the curve. And I think we will leave questions for the end. Yep. So at this point, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Thank you. That was extremely important. That's important. The next speaker is Bill Muma, Dr. Bill Muma, who is the lead author of five international panel on climate change IPCC papers, which resulted in Nobel Prize. Bill is also the architect of the concept of forestation, and he is a professor emeritus at Tufts University. Thank you for being with us. Bill. Thank you, and uh, Lee, that was wonderful. I had the pleasure of spending the last the three days uh, out in the Adirondacks with Lee and Bob Leverett and a number of other people, and it's uh, it's really wonderful to be with people who can read a forest and read its history, uh, and uh, really enriches the experience. Um, I'm going to pick up on on uh, on uh, the, uh, the the climate story because that's what I've been working on. I I spent about 20 years working on uh, technological solutions to climate change, and I finally decided that that's well enough in hand that uh, I didn't need to spend more time on it. Already, you've done all that for my own self, and it's all possible. So, uh, and 
I realized there was a, a, a huge gap that I'll talk about in a moment, which is uh, forest in the natural world. I don't know if you've been noticing, but in the last few days, the sky has not been blue. It is, um, I actually took this picture this morning. It was worse than this yesterday. I meant to take the picture yesterday, it didn't, but it still was bad enough this morning. It shows up. And um, why is that? Well, this is a, um, uh, a NASA uh, uh, composite photograph. And you can see, let me see, I think the, uh, yeah, there's the pointer. Uh, the fires are out here in uh, Western Canada. And here's a smoke river coming right to the Adirondacks, right over the Adirondacks and off into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, we are seeing the manifestation of this increase in wildfires. And those are caused by the change in climate. And um, what I'm hoping to do today is to, uh, 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 the, the, the people who study climate and the people who study forestry don't talk to each other very much. And there's a huge amount of knowledge that foresters have, and a huge amount of knowledge that climate scientists have, and forest ecologists have, and we could have multiplicative benefits if we could all talk to each other and figure out how we're going to address this climate problem. So I'm hoping that what I say today will um, motivate some of you to uh, become engaged. Um, historically, when you think about it, uh, 400 years ago when the, when the when the Puritans arrived in New England, it was a howling wilderness, said John Winthrop, filled with wild beasts and savages and a wall of forest like Europeans had never seen before. So their mission, their God-given mission, was to civilize this land, them in cutting down all the forests, turning it into the agriculture and uh, villages that they were familiar with in Europe. And we've had this attitude all along that forests are considered primarily a natural resource with a single focus on sustainable forestry that assures continuous extraction of wood and fiber. Um, uh, only recently has begun to be re recognized that forests along with oceans are principal components of the operating system of the planet. And unless accelerating climate change is slow and reverse, there will be no forest for resource production. So we have to work together to figure out how do we use the forest in order to help solve climate, as well as to provide, continue to provide um, forest products. Um, so what do I mean when I say forest and oceans are key components of the Earth's operating system? Forests remove near the, uh, from the atmosphere nearly 30% of the emissions we, meet, we, we, we emit every year. They don't pick out the ones we emit. They're constantly taking it from the atmosphere. And at the end of the year, they, 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 as you'll see in a moment, it's really remarkable how much less carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere. And that produces the increase in temperatures. And forests uh, evaporate water, uh, which, uh, which reduces uh, regional temperatures, which is a good thing when the overall temperature is rising. And it transports the water um, remotely. Um, I came across an amazing figure the other day that the Amazon, which is the largest river in the world, is bigger than something like five Mississippi rivers, uh, transports uh, the most water of any river in the world to the ocean. But the atmosphere from the Amazon forest transports more water to the coast of Brazil. That's where all the rainfall comes from. That's what fills the reservoirs that run the hydropower in Brazil. And as they are demolishing the forests in the Amazon, they're having droughts in the eastern part of, Africa, of, of, of Brazil. And um, as we know, they produce 25 quarter of the Earth's oxygen, and they're the most biodiverse systems on the planet. So human caused global warming. I'm not sure what that's off to the side, but it is. OK. Um, uh, basically, as you know, the sun comes, um, comes, comes through the atmosphere and, uh, oops. Can we get that back uh, working again? There you go. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. My big thumbs are too clumsy here. Um, and and uh, and warms the earth, and the uh, uh, then the the the, the earth as it's warmer is radiating heat back into space, 
you know, it's what you feel on a hot summer day crossing the black pavement. You just feel the radiation heading for outer space with gases like carbon dioxide, and water vapor, and methane and other things trap that, re-radiate some of it back to space and some of it back to Earth. What's amazing is the total amount of energy that we get from the heat in the atmosphere is greater than what we get directly from the sun on a given day. It's a lot. So um, we call this not the greenhouse effect, but the hot car effect. We've all, all experienced that. Outside air temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. In one hour, the car interior is 125 degrees. And we hear these tragic stories about people leaving their dogs or children in hot cars on hot days. So don't do it. Um, this is just showing the record from with, with the earliest time we have decent thermometer records, about 1850, up to uh, the early 2020s. And the uh, uh, orange uh, line here is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's measured on right over here. We're up actually above 420 now. And this shows the best estimates we have of the temperatures in each of the years. And there's a lot of oscillating up and down, but there's no question that the trend is up. And it, the, the Earth is not heating uniformly. It's heating up much more uh, in, the, in the polar regions. Uh, this doesn't show up very well in this projection, but uh, it's very uneven. And that's why we're getting these things like the breakout of the Arctic vortex. And you get these strange uh, patterns of the, uh, of the um, of jet stream, which are causing changes in the weather, the dramatic uh, changes that just, you know, if you're, if you're across one of those jet stream boundaries, you could be 100 miles apart and one place would be very cold and the other would be very hot. It's just quite remarkable stuff. Um, 20, um, uh, 20, uh, 21 was a, a, a remarkable year. It's the year that uh, carbon dioxide increased by 50% above pre-industrial levels. And uh, you can see here's the 50% increase. And um, I asked myself, well, if we had, if we had 30% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if the forests weren't working, that uh, temp that the concentration would have occurred at about 1960. And um, uh, and that's here. And uh, where we would be today, we'd be up here at 542 parts per million. So next time you're in the forest, thank them for keeping things from getting so out of control. Um, I, uh, uh, to the students here, this will be on the final exam. Um, it's, a, it's an IPCC report. And all I want to do is show you that there's a lot of work that's gone into figuring out all these fluxes going in all directions, from the, uh, from the Earth back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and, uh, and vice versa, the removals. So we'll take a closer look at that here. Um, this is the global carbon cycle, um, and what you can see is that uh, each year fossil fuel emissions are about 9.6 billion tons of carbon a year. And uh, emissions from the land are 1.2. That's from deforestation, forest degradation, wetland uh, destruction, uh, soil degradation, and so forth. By the way, about a third of all the additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today since 1750 is from deforestation and land degradation. So it's a big, big part of that. I think it's all fossil fuels, but it's not. And yet the remarkable thing is we're putting in 10.8 billion tons a year, and the increase in the atmosphere is only 5.2. I'll point out, we have a bargain here. <laughs> this is a really good deal. Imagine if, if, if something weren't helping us out, and of course, what's helping us, helping us out is are the uh, uh, the removal by plants on land, primarily forests. About ninety some percent, about ninety percent of this is by forests and the oceans. And that's what I mean about these being the key components in the functional operation of the planet. And um, so. Um, uh, how did we get to the climate goals that we supposedly have? In 1992, the climate treaty was agreed to in, in, uh, in uh, Rio, it was the Rio Earth Summit, as it was called at the time. And it's, it had a very simple statement, which is scientifically correct. Not all treaties are scientifically uh, correct in their statements. 
The goal of this convention is to achieve a concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that will avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Great goal doesn't say what it is because nobody knew in 1992 what it was. Actually, a scientist named George Woodwell and a young Indian lawyer named Kiliparthi Ramakrishna drafted this part of the treaty back then. It was good that they asked the scientists to help them out. Um, and it um, took until 2015 until somebody defined what dangerous meant. And uh, so in this agreement, it's that we should uh, do every, uh, not increase global average temperatures, keep it well below two degrees, and then at the assistance of small island nations, this other phrase, and uh, pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees above three industrial levels. And then parties should take action to conserve and enhance as appropriate sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases including forests. So we managed to get forests in there as part of the solution. And uh, the global temperature today, by the way, has risen by 1.2 degrees. I mean, we're going to clearly blow through 1.5, there's no question about it. Uh, but people say, do we just give up? No. I mean, there's bad, there's worse, and there's just awful. And if we can just keep it at bad, we can work it back from there and uh, maybe make some differences. So after this bold diplomatic move, uh, move the uh, government said to turn to the scientists and said, pray, dear scientists, tell us, what, what will it take to stay within one and a half degrees? And uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, the, is an institution that they can go to and get this kind of question answered. And here's language from the, uh, from the report. To achieve, uh, to achieve keeping temperatures from ex rising excessively, Global net anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions must decline by about 45% from 2005 levels by 2030, reaching net zero around 2050. And then nobody read the next paragraph and be net negative from there to the end of the simulation, which is 2100. Right. And that 2100, it's still going down. But we can't keep it down unless we're in net negative territory. Um, and um, so we must simultaneously reduce emissions and increase the removal from the atmosphere. How are we doing? And the answer is, of course, not very well. Um, the uh, uh, green up here, this shows uh, historically going back to 1990, we're up to this territory here with the promises we might be here and we need to be here for two degrees and here for one and a half degrees. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. So not putting it in, um, one of the most important things we can do is energy efficiency, doing more with less. Um, this is a home that my wife and I built in, uh, 20, moved in in 2007. Um, uses 20% of the energy of a, of a standard coke-built house in New England at the time. Lots of super insulation, walls, ceilings, ultra-low air leafage, super efficient windows and doors. And the windows are placed on the south side to collect solar gain in the winter, and the roof is, is uh, overhanging to so that it blocks the sun in the summer, so you don't need air conditioning. And uh, so this has worked really well. We have a ground source heat pump, and so on. It's all uh, very carefully put together. Here's just showing the energy supplies we can then use that are zero carbon. Wind, solar, the house is run entirely on solar energy, connected to the grid. Um, for off the grid at night, export in the daytime, over a year we export more than we import. Um, wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, geothermal, and then people overlook the solar heated land and water, which are a great source of energy for building space conditioning in the wintertime. We draw the heat from the ground, which we do, and uh, about 55 degrees, we just have a heat pump raised to about 85 degrees, we have radiant floors, and that's enough to keep everything comfortable, so we don't have to have a boiler making water go to steam at 212 degrees, running it through radiators, and uh, having a very cumbersome system of controlling it. The other thing we can do is remove carbon dioxide. You hear a lot, there's a lot of billions of dollars in the uh, uh, recent federal legislation. Um, I looked up the International Energy Agency. As of September, there were 18 direct air capture systems removing about altogether 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year which is equal to the annual emissions of 700 Americans. Only one of these that's removing 4,000 tons is the one in Iceland that you read about. It's using zero carbon electricity from geothermal 
and it's depositing the carbon in the, in the holes in the, in the rock, which form right, chemically with carbon dioxide is stored indefinitely. Can't beat that. Of course, it's, it's costing something, I don't know, several thousand ton, uh, dollars a ton to remove it with this technology. And all of the others are not carbon negative or neutral because they're using electricity and so on from the grid, which is not a carbon zero grid. Um, the other thing is you can let trees grow. There's a concept that's been overlooked by the scientific part of the climate community, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But if you look at it, it's about 3 point billion tons of carbon dioxide per year removed by forests in the world. That's equal to the annual emissions of half the Americans. And uh, the U.S. forests are uh, removing just 12% of what we need. So net zero means we get to a point where the, the oceans and the forests and the other plants on land are removing as much as we put in. And net negative means nature's taking more out than putting in. So that's a simple, a simple argument. Um, I uh, looked at a lot of reports, like the National Academy reports and things, and was shocked when I saw how little, um, as you look at the solutions, how little was expected from, from forests. Very small amount from forests. And the reason is they only included um, afforestation and reforestation. Well, you know, in the next 30 years, a tree planted a day isn't going to do a whole lot. By 2100, it'll do quite a bit. But it's still going to be small compared to what the potential is for the existing forests that are already removing 30%. If more of them were allowed to keep growing, it could be even more. So they've ignored the 30% in favor of about 3 to 5% and don't include the management practice that might allow us to remove much more carbon dioxide as our forests. Um, so how do you get big trees? This is me standing next to a big tree in the uh, Mohawk State Forest in Western Massachusetts. And uh, we let more trees, let more of them grow. I'm not saying we let them all grow, but we let enough of them grow that we'll get enough removal to make a difference. And so I realized there was no term for this, and so I and my two co-authors came up with the term proforestation to complement afforestation, reforestation. Forestation means to grow a forest. And, and as you know, reforestation means to replant a forest that's, that's uh, been harvested or lost to uh, natural disasters. And afforestation means to plant trees somewhere they haven't been before. So if you already have trees growing, you don't have to worry as in afforestation that you have to find land to do it. Uh, these trees are already there. It's just a question of picking which ones you're going to let grow and which ones you're not going to let grow. And um, the goal is to manage uh, without harvest to reach their potential for biodiversity and carbon accumulation. So it's not a, it's not a, a formulaic proposal. This is where U.S. foresters could be immensely helpful. There might be situations where forest forestry practices can be part of this. So I'll show you in a moment. Um, so larger uh, trees in older and growing forests accumulate the most atmospheric <coughs> carbon over time and store it in the wood and the trunk limbs and soils. And since the dry weight of wood is roughly 50% carbon in all different species, that's a lot, of, a lot of carbon that's being held. Um, I've done a lot of work with Professor Beverly Law and various people out in uh, the Pacific Northwest, Oregon State University and uh, Idaho State University. And uh, this was a, a project that was initiated by them. Um, and it, it, uh, it, I don't know if you can see it on this, in this picture, but there are large clear cuts all through these. This is a national forest land. And uh, the, uh, the question was, if you could, afford, this is for the state of Oregon, if you could plant trees everywhere that was possible, it wasn't already forest or city or, or uh, agriculture, how much could you have added uh, by 2100 in terms of carbon stored? And this afforestation thing's about 18 million tons. If you reforest all these clear cuts, you get up to something around uh, 55 million tons. If you did this reduced forest, which is a, a proforestation concept, it would, the idea was you would halt harvesting on half of the national forests and double the uh, rotation uh, period on private lands. You'd end up with something up here about 150 
million tons. In other words, letting more trees grow, some on lands that are still being, um, you know, still producing uh, wood products. Uh, but instead of seeing every forest as a financial forest to be managed uh, at current uh, sustainable uh, forestry management levels, it's setting aside some of them to allow them to keep growing. And uh, the um, here's a proforestation success story. There is a real example in the world where this was done at work. It's Tasmania, Australia, one of the states in Australia. It's the island state of Australia, Australia is the south of the Big Island. They halted harvesting half the forests that they were harvesting on Tasmania and reduced emissions from the forests in seven years of growth to become net negative for the whole state. And here's the graphic that's in the state uh, uh, publication. Um, and uh, these are, are the different, uh, I just said, jumps ahead, I'm not supposed to do that. All right. We'll load it back up. Here we go. Okay. So here are the data. Uh, the red is uh, 2018. The green is 2005 levels that you're measuring against. And all of the sectors are about the same throughout that period. But in uh, in 2005, uh, the um, uh, forestry sector, land use, land use change, and forestry sector was emitting 10 million tons of CO2 per year, and by um, uh, 2018, it was removing 12 million tons of CO2 per year. And it's a dramatic change, and uh, this, is, this is the only change of this scale that has actually been documented, but it, it, it demonstrates that this makes a difference. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, the, the, it was enough to offset all the other emissions, this extra, extra removal. So, um, another sort of shocking thing to me is in less than 20 years, Canadian forests went from a net sink, removing 160 million tons of CO2 per year from the atmosphere, to adding 24 million tons a year. These figures, the 160, is the average for uh, the 1990s, and the uh, plus 24 is the average for the, uh, for the 20, uh, 20 um, up, up through the 2010s, all the 2010s. And you can see it here on this. Uh, that it's really just plummeted, and it's now in, in a, 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 a source uh, situation. And how did that happen? Well, they've had fires. And they've had, oh, by the way, there's a strange system. Each country gets to set, say what its managed forests are, and for the international accounting, those are the only ones that count. So Canada didn't want to put in its boreal forest because it didn't want to have fires come against them. Okay, just don't call them your managed forest. You don't have to, have to report them. Uh, this is the sort of travesty of diplomacy. It needs to, you know, be a little more aligned with the real world, and um, and so they just have their managed forest. Well, this is a lot of this is British Columbia. Um, in addition to the fires and the um, insects damage, um, uh, traps, which is the big biggest coal plant in Europe, which is converting to burning wood, because the Europeans have a declaration that says that we must be 100% renewable. Says nothing about whether it's high carbon or not. Well, burning wood releases more carbon dioxide per unit of kilowatt hour produced than does burning coal. Right there, if you just look at the heat content, it's slightly, slightly more. But but wood doesn't burn as hot as coal, and therefore the efficiency of the of, of running the the the, the, uh, the steam and, and it can can't, can't be made as hot, and it's not as efficient. So this just shows a a. Uh, uh, what, what has happened there? So that's the, that's the opposite example uh, of the way you get this managed forest and have this happen. Uh, most people aren't familiar with this paper. It was published by the U.S. Forest Service, and it was um, about uh, how much uh, in how much emissions there are from the forestry sector. And um, you can see here that the, the little wedges are. Um, insects, fire, wind, drought, harvest, and land conversion. And the red part is harvesting. The emissions from harvesting are 85% of the total. I did a little looking up the things and I found that the, uh, the total is about 160 million metric tons of carbon per year, which is comparable to 
the emissions from all buildings in the United States every year, not counting electricity use. So this is heating primarily. Um, so it's a lot because uh, uh, a lot of a tree does not go into a board, right? It's uh, uh, the branches don't go in, the roots don't go in, the uh, slab wood doesn't go in. A lot of it is sawdust at the mill, and uh, and, uh, and and so and, and then there's also a lot of collateral damage, particularly with these big. Uh, uh, fellers and bunchers. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of carbon dioxide is emitted very rapidly when trees are harvested. Here's another surprising set of studies. Uh, looking at all the, whatever, what, what was the amount of carbon in forests in California, Oregon, and Washington in 1900 when the forestry industry started? And where is it today? And uh, it turns out that today, uh, I mean, some of it's obviously in long-lived wood products. 19%. Some of it's in landfills, 16%. But 65% of it is in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And so we have this legacy from the past that we're also dealing with. So it's not just what we're emitting today. We have to take that out as well as the legacy that we have. So that's just part of the story. Um, here's a surprising, this is US Forest Service data. And uh, it goes uh, from dark green to pink. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, pink is um, uh, 40 metric tons per hectare, and the dark green is uh, 130 um, uh, per hectare, uh, 30, 130 metric tons per hectare. Most of, of, of Maine is, is, is very low carbon density. There's just a lot of little trees there. There's, uh, that's one of the reasons that the forestry industry collapsed. But what's stunning is that there are uh, two very large green spots. This one you all can figure out what that is. That's the Adirondacks. But here is another large green spot right here. It's actually larger in area. Um, but it's uh, this is southern Vermont, New Hampshire, and western Massachusetts from the from the corner here with the, with the Connecticut. And uh, that's always a surprise to everyone that there is so much carbon there. But this is the area that was abandoned from agriculture around 1850. Everybody went to Ohio. They cut down the trees in Ohio. They didn't have to farm rocks. It was a real good deal. <coughs> and those, those lands were it was benign neglect. And it's the, it, and the, the upper New York State and the Western and, and Massachusetts reforestation is the greatest reforestation story in the history of the world. And it was all done by neglect. Imagine what we could do if we set up to do it on purpose. So um, there's a lot, this is just a picture I took yesterday, a, a group of us out here looking at this incredible high carbon storage and old growth and Adirondack trees. And uh, there's, uh, there's Lee who is, uh, is uh, holding up that small tree <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and was giving us a, an exposition on that uh, very much large tree. Amazing, it's just extraordinary. Uh, we also have some pretty big trees in Massachusetts, nowhere near the number or the scale, but this is in uh, some of our reserves in western Massachusetts. And I had to put this one in. There's Bob Leverett measuring one of them right there. Good job, Bob. <laughs> now, um, the climate science has gotten together with the biological scientists and uh, just uh, this point that natural world of forests, plants, and oceans removes 56% of annual emissions from the atmosphere. And uh, here's their language, linking biodiversity and climate change is a single problem that requires an integrated approach. And only by considering climate and biodiversity as part of the same complex problem, which also includes the actions and motivations and aspirations of people, can solutions be developed to avoid maladaption and maximize the beneficial outcomes. So as Lee was saying, you know, this, this is um, well, all, all those, uh, those different combinations of, he was talking mostly of trees, and then of course deer. Uh, but but the, that is the complex that we have to look at. And uh, in 2022, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for the first time, had a lot to say about the natural world. Safeguarding biodiversity and ecosystems is fundamental to climate resilient development. A lot of the threats that uh, um, that uh, climate change poses for them and their roles in adaptation and mitigation. And the IPCC makes a judgment call. They, that's very high confidence that that's the case. And then uh, recent analysis suggests that it's uh, an, uh, 
we have to have effective and ec equitable conservation of approximately 30 to 50 percent of Earth's land, freshwater, and ocean areas, including currently near natural ecosystems. High confidence in that. And then finally, um, it is also the case that protection of existing natural forest ecosystems is the highest priority for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I was amazed to see that was our paper. Uh, and restoration may not always be practical. Anyway, this is the view of the IPCC. And there's the reference. So let me just wrap this up by saying, uh, I think what I'm getting at here is we need to establish two kinds of forests. Uh, on the left, we have uh, one of these very large uh, white pines that we have in Western Massachusetts. On the left is Ski Houghton, on the right is Wayne Walker, the two very prominent uh, uh, forest climate scientists. And uh, the idea would be to, to create some strategic climate and biodiversity reserves in order to get, uh, we have to make a decision. How do we do that? That's a political process, but it should have the input of foresters and scientists and the public and, uh, and everyone, I guess. It would be a difficult process, but it's important. Um, uh, and the other would be to have industrial production for us. This photo was taken about 15 miles from the one on the right. Uh, Massachusetts is a pretty small state. Uh, but um, can we keep those separate enough that we can actually have forests do the job of assuring that we have forests <laughs> to be able to produce uh, wood products in the future as well as address the climate? And you're probably familiar with this uh, discussion, but uh, nature needs half. Um, and uh, this was, was a recent statement by E.O. Wilson, co-founder of the Biodiversity Science World, along with um, Tom Lovejoy, each of whom died one on Christmas Day and the day after in 2021. But he brought up the first one and brought up this notion of nature needs half. Um, so um, here, <clears throat> now, these people are searching for a climate solution. And if they looked up, a major climate solution is growing in plain sight. This is from the trip we had here last year. It was wonderful. We're grateful that there is an Adirondacks the way it is. And thank all of you for the work you do in keeping it that way. Thank you. Finally, we have Bob Levin, our Oriole mathematician, the evangelist of old growth forest, and a, and a great naturalist and a dear friend. Thank you for being here, Bob. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate your attendance. And my, my following these two great scientists is, is a tough uh, job for me, but I'm going to do the best I can because basically what I do is measure. I'm an engineer by education and, and practice. And what I do is actually try to ground truth what uh, the, the models give us. So what I'm going to share with you today is how I go about uh, supporting them by measuring trees for carbon. And you can see the four areas I'm going to cover. Sources of information about carbon sequestration that all of us have basically access to through the internet. Uh, then checking on those sources of carbon sequestration, you know, whatever numbers they give us, whatever statements they make, you're actually going out and measuring trees. And how we do it, we say, well, okay, but we've been measuring trees for decades and decades. Yes, we do, but not for the same things. Most of the measurement of trees has been for economic purposes, to identify the part of the tree that really gives us wood products and measure that. There's a world of good information on that. But the whole tree is a different story. And then misunderstandings about the data that we get based upon the measurements that we take. And finally, conclusions, which you might have guessed I would have, is that these big trees uh, have a big role to play. Now, whoops, I just do. Oh, okay. Who knows about carbon sequestration? 
There's plenty of people out there involved in it. If you go to the internet uh, to find out, we'll say, okay, I've got my tree in my front yard. Uh, it's, it's growing very well, but how is it helping us? How much carbon dioxide is it actually sequestering? And you might find, for example, the Arbor Day Foundation, a pretty prestigious organization, but they say in one year, a mature tree, and this is what you find on the internet, uh, absorbs about 48 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent, basically, of carbon dioxide out of the air uh, from the atmosphere, and it releases oxygen in exchange. Well, that sounds very positive, it sounds very good. 48 pounds doesn't sound like very much. Um, individual sources out there, people doing blogs, whatever, <clears throat> who gather information from other sources, can come up with statements like this. Maple trees absorb about 22 pounds of CO2 per year. That doesn't really sound very much, does it? Now let's go to some trusted sources of uh, information, professional sources. I'm giving you an example here. <clears throat> taking a sugar maple growing from a diameter of 40 inches in one year to 40.2 inches in the next year. That's diameter breast height. So that's not much of a change in diameter over the time, but let's see what happens to it. And one model that I use quite a bit, uh, which I call FIA or FIA Coal Forest and Green Horn Analysis Carbon Online Estimator uh, Program, uh, that, that a model was developed to support. Uh, here's what we get. If we go from, let's say, 40 inches and 100 feet tall to 40.2 inches and 105 feet tall, then in that one year, the additional carbon dioxide sequester would not be 48 pounds or 22, it'd be 399. Well, that gives an individual tree a little bit more of a role. Uh, then another source of information out there, mainly for urban trees, is the iTree uh, system. Uh, I -tree, uh, and urban foresters use this commonly. They give us numbers associated with going from 40 inches to 40.2 inches. Now, you can use that on the internet. They don't uh, allow you to specify a height of the tree. They deal strictly with diameter. So going from, on the tree, going from 40 to 40.2, they would say 327 pounds. Oddly, if you start off at 40.2, they give you 324 pounds. So this <laughs> problem is with all these models. Nonetheless, one of the U.S. Forest Service's mainline biomass models was given 271 pounds. That's a little low. A Canadian biomass calculator would give us 410 pounds. Okay, uh, you can read those numbers as well as I can read them all. But I want to reinforce this. But that's a heck of a lot different when we talk about 399 up to 410 or whatever in 48 pounds. So we're inundated with information about carbon sequestration, but a lot of it is just not accurate at all. Now, what I'd like to do is turn toward uh, individual models, those professional models as I would call them, and, and look at uh, the carbon growth of, of a prominent pine. In, in this particular case, a white pine, in 350-year increments, you see how it works on these individual models. Now, I'm going to hope I hit the... Yeah, I did it, I did it. Uh, okay, if you look here, you have fire coal, you have a, a Westfield, Scott, Westfall, I'm sorry, what, uh, Jim Westfall, what, and Scott uh, model. That, that was a taper model <coughs> converted to volume here, to volume. Uh, that was Clark, Suter, and Schlegel from the southeast. I can't read that anymore over there, whatever it is. Anyway, these are all different models. Notice, though, what happens in the first 50 years. This is how much volume you're gaining or carbon equivalent. In the second 50 years, there's more than there was in the first 50 years. So going from 50 to 100 years, you gain more carbon than you get from 0 to 50. I'll bet a lot of people don't know that. And I almost guarantee you they don't know this. Going from 50, 100 to 150 years, you actually have another pulse where you gain more carbon at that age. Now, of course, if we're assuming the tree is in good shape. We're not, we're not assuming the tree is in the process of dying. But nonetheless, this is a model. 
This is not Bob Weber saying it. This is the mob saying it. Westfall Scott, another source, same kind of pattern. Not exactly the same totals, but the same pattern. Watch as it is. We go across. These first five models are basically the same pattern. This one, which is very high use, the Jenkins model, actually shows less carbon gain, the most carbon gain in the first 50 years. But then it drops down, then it builds back up a little. But the 50, is, the first 50 years is great. I would bet a lot of uh, uh, people look at that, look at that model, and say, "Okay, we're going to get most of our work done in the first 50 years." Well, what about these other models? Okay, let me go to the next one. Now, so I took the fire coal model, as you can see here, and I applied it to a tree that is actually a tree uh, that it grows in western Massachusetts. It is a white pine, colossal tree. And I constructed these numbers based upon fast assumption of fast growth for a tree, a white pine, uh, in that climate, et cetera, and whatnot. And so we're going from this diameter in this height to this diameter in this height. Now, forget about all of the stuff moving across. Just look out there at the very end. And I'm going to have to move over here a little bit so I can see it better. But see how much of the annual increase you get in pounds of carbon uh, at, at these different sizes. You can see the biggest tree is still giving us the most annual increase in carbon. These may be at a fast rate, but not as much overall. This tree is still doing the most work. And I developed the equations. That was what John gave me the credit for uh, the mathematical end of it to compute what these models give. This particular one here is this first model, uh, the, the, the fire coal model. Uh, anyway, I mean, this is coal range fire coal. Now I've got to find the next one. Okay. But if, if we want to check on this stuff, if we want to check on these statistical models, what do we do? We call it ground truthing. So we go out uh, and, oops, here we go. Uh, and one way that we check on how much log, how much tree is growing and convert that to carbon and from carbon to carbon dioxide, we climb the trees as Will Bozan of Appalachian Armors is doing here. And this is in Mohawk Trail State Forest. We're not doing this as, um, you know, just uh, taking uh, liberties. The, the Department of Environmental Management was there with, them, with us. And we get up on and we measure the girth or, or the circumference uh, of the tree at intervals all the way up until you can't, uh, you're at the danger zone. And, and from this kind of very direct measurement, we can uh, compute the volume that is in the trunk of the tree. Now, once we've done that, and let me go over here, here's our, our tree. And so we're, we're measuring it. Um, if we're going up, actually doing a climb on it, then we would take uh, diameter measurements every set interval. But, well, that's very labor intensive. So we also can do it from the ground using the right kind of instruments. So we would set up targets along the, the, the bowl of the tree and measure the diameters at those points with particular kinds of equipment and then model the sections of the tree or the trunk through some kind of a geometrical solid. And we would call that a frustum, a mathematical term. And we would treat the shape of the trunk as either, well, uh, if, if you, on the inside where the, uh, the curve is concave, we would call it a needle shape. And if it's straight line, then that would be a conical shape. If there's a bulge here, it would be a paraboloid shape. And so we can mathematically compute how much volume is in each of these sections. 
that we, uh, we measure. All we just have to do is get the right measurements at these points. Uh, and uh, we do that with instruments. And folks, we spend an awful lot of time. You know, we're really obsessed with this. We're a little bit crazy. <laughs> and, and as an engineer, I'm not actually trying to prove A or B one side or the other. I'm looking to get these numbers as accurate as I can to as many decimal places as I can. And that gives me, you know, a high. So if I keep the right number, then I'm, I'm a happy camper. Uh, and it turns out that I can do that with instruments such as this little beast. And this little beast here is a, a, a monocular with a range-finding reticle. And it's extremely accurate. I can measure to uh, the diameter of a tree to under a half of, of an inch and a distance of 100 feet or more. And this, this instrument here is a, uh, from Bushnell. <coughs> and uh, I uh, call this one Gizmo. This is it, my instruments all have names. Gizmo, so meet Gizmo. And taking gizmo, I can be back here, there's my eye, and then I shoot to the trunk, and this instrument allows me to, to get the width here, this line here, measure that. But the instrument assumes that I have the distance from my eye all the way to the center line, and since I don't, I hit the front of the trunk, I have to do some mathematical wizardry to take care of that if it's a circular trunk. So I'm in my monstrous glory if I can be working out an equation to, to measure these things and drive my, my life monitor crazy because I run, I'm running down to the, to the kitchen and say, look at what I've just done. Huh? <laughs> she pats me on, on, on the head and sends me back. <laughs> Let's see, let me go to the next one. Well, the, the next kind of measurement that, that I'm going to do is from wherever I take one diameter and another, how much distance is there in that? Well, we, we measure these trees, the heights from a distance, uh, using laser rangefinders or laser, <coughs> more full instruments, laser hypsometer. And then we, we actually calculate if we can shoot to a point from our eye to the trunk of the tree, and that would be the hypotenuse of that right triangle, and if we can take that angle there uh, and, and then take the sine function of it, then we will have the height above eye level of that point. Well, we just take it on different spots going up the tree, so we can march ourselves right up the tree and measure the, the heights of those sections that you saw on the previous slide, and we're just the happy campers when we do that. We really pat ourselves on the back. At any rate, we go through, and it is a highly mathematical, but rather basic mathematics, mathematical process. And we, we get the volumes, the diameters, and the heights, and then the thrust and the volumes, and we build a whole tree up. And let me go to the next one. Now, because we actually measure the volumes of the trees section by section and put, put them all together, we can decide or determine pretty readily how much a tree is gained in volume over time based upon the diameters uh, at one point in time versus another, etc. And I'm, I'm always dealing with uh, folks who have a misunderstanding on this particular topic. So I want to show you here uh, what happens, that what we learned early on a lot of the idea was if your diameter growth is uh, great and you have a new ring, an annual ring that's fat, that means overall more volume growth. So you would then maybe see that happen more readily in a young tree. So the idea is that the young trees are really growing fast and they're doing all of the work. It sounds reasonable. It just ain't so, folks. Here is a, a tree that I actually measured. It's, it was named after Chief Jake Swamp of the Aquasocity Mohawks, who was a personal friend of mine. He's passed on, but he, he uh, had an organization, the Trees of Peace. At any rate, we named this tree Jake Swamp White Pine for him. At any rate, looking at circumference growth, pure circumference, here's the, what happens to this tree 
over the, or did over the first 50 years. You see, it, it got to this size in the first 50 years, circumference wise. The, the amount of growth in the second period, circumference growth, uh, which would translate equally to diameter, is from 50 to 100, there's that much growth. And then from 100 to 150, talking about the circumference growth, there's that much growth. Obviously, there's more growth in the first 50 years than in, than in the second, and in more in the second than in the third. That would sound like all of the volume or, or, or the, the amount of wood that's being added is being added in this first 50 years. And look also going out to height. If we start in the first 50 years, we've got uh, the, the tree gets up to maybe 100 feet in height, growing at the rate of two feet per year. And we find that on these white pines in particular, they take off and they really shoot up there. And you look at that and you say, well, that certainly <coughs> proves, doesn't it? that the, the younger the tree, the, the, the more rapid the growth, and therefore the more carbon in it, volume, et cetera. This is the second 50 years, that's the third 50 years. So it's growing very rapidly in height in these early years in that per uh, year and, or annual growth rate comes down. But here is the big story. This is the actual amount of wood, the volume, when translated to biomass, that this tree gained in the first, Jake Swamp tree, gained in the first 50 years. This is how much volume it added in the second 50 years, from 50 to 100, obviously more than the first 50. And this really surprised me because I wasn't so sure that uh, it would, I, I thought it would probably really slow down. But in the third 50 year period, 100, 150 years, that's how much volume growth it had. So it was gaining volume at a greater rate, a greater amount as it got larger. This was was really not widely understood. You know, in, in my uh, engineering mind, I didn't assume anything. I just went out and did the measurements and constructed the model. And all of a sudden, the big trees, the really big trees, were growing in terms of the actual absolute amount of wood, not a percentage increase, but the absolute increase. We're doing more in these later years than the earlier years. And I've had a lot of debates, folks, with people who argue the other way and haven't lost one. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's some. Here's another point that we, uh, we, we can, I've got to make sure I get that. Okay. A fat ring, a fat ring on a small trunk might, it does represent fast growth. And you might say, okay, if the tree has got this wide a ring on this size of the trunk, it's adding more wood than if it had a narrower ring on, let's say, a larger trunk. Well, I constructed this, these diagrams are scaled to size. This is all these three rings are all the same cross-sectional area. So a narrow ring on a big trunk can add as much actual wood as a big fat ring on a little trunk. And I do this all the time, measuring the annual rings, computing how much additional volume growth there was or cross-sectional area in this case. And as the tree gets bigger, its ring does in fact get narrow. You might look at that if you were coring the tree and coming up with uh, of rates of growth of one. You say, well, this tree is down to almost nothing. It's dormant. It's not doing anything. Not true. Uh, next one. Now, I had to razzle you and dazzle you a little bit with my math. I mean, that's, it goes, I drive my wife, Monica, crazy with this stuff. Hey, look, God, I got another for me. Well, this is nothing. This is pretty simple math here. But what I wanted to show was, here is a conical form. It's just a cone. Uh, and uh, here it is. And now I'm going to double its height, and I'm going to double its diameter. What do I do to the volume, the amount of increase? What do I do if I double the, uh, these two dimensions? And the answer is I increase the volume by a factor of eight, not double it, or not by four. I've, I've doubled the height, I've doubled the diameter, but I've increased the volume by a factor of eight. 
that starts to give you an insight into the value of a large tree gaining maybe just a little bit as a ring width and not all that much as a height component, but in terms of the actual amount of wood that it adds, that gets to be really sizable. And so the conclusion is that big trees are really important for carbon storage because at the rates that they grow, even though it looks small if you measure the annual ring or the additional height, they're actually packing on the pounds. And these trees in the Adirondacks, folks, are often growing very rapidly. I've measured hundreds of them over the years and watched these numbers march up. And the big trees are doing a remarkable job. They're not senescent. That's ridiculous. If, if you go out and you do the actual measuring and you plot it out, you find, unless, of course, they're dying. I mean, if they quit growing altogether, I can't make an argument. But I'm talking about a tree that's in really good health. And to, to further this idea of the importance of big tree size, I did this for some uh, a person over in the Czech Republic. And, and through Bill and whatnot, we, you know, they, they just wanted to say, well, this was really an urban situation because this was a town in the Czech, in the Czech Republic and they, were, they wanted to cut all the big trees down and plant little saplings under the idea that a few little saplings six feet apart, because they grow fast presumably all on the other slides, that they will actually add more volume and ergo carbon and ergo carbon dioxide than a big tree that just does a tiny bit. Well, here's an actual tree in uh, western Massachusetts, growing on the uh, property next to the Smith College campus. And that's its height and that's its uh, diameter. Okay, that one mature tree there, if you drop down to trees, it is 100 feet tall and 54 inches in diameter. It's proper, folks. But that's big. It's big. It's a big tree. One tree. Though. Now, if we go to 50 foot tall trees, 12 inches in diameter, we have to have 35 of them to match the volume. If we went down to, let's say, 40 inches tall and 6 inches in diameter, it would take 151 of these trees volume-wise to match that volume. And going all the way down to a 25-foot tall tree and a 4-inch diameter, and that's a lot bigger than they were planting. They were planting seedlings. It would take 465 of them, and they're not going to put them to get, you know, 2 inches apart. That would be a lot of real estate. So a lot of them, the city of Northampton, so they they help they asked me to help them out figure out well okay what's the trade off if we got a big tree versus uh, a lot of little trees and surprisingly enough a lot of people just don't go through the math and realize that these big trees are extremely important in terms of the growth and in the Adirondacks big trees are are pretty common over a lot of the landscape. You don't, you, sure, sure, we need to plant a lot more trees. The, the reforestation, the afforestation the, it all is fine, but the proforestation part of it here is actually the most important piece according to my calculations. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay a little longer and entertain some questions, or do we need to exit at the? Does everybody want to leave, or you want to stay for some questions? <laughs> okay. Questions. We'll take some questions. Thank you all. Yeah. Wonderful talks. Questions. questions. Yeah. Surely. Our questions. <coughs> Don't be shy. All right, I'll start with a question. No, there's right. Shelby. Oh, you're very to him. Shelby. I have a question. I saw the charts with the circumference growth and the height growth and then the volume growth and I saw a 150 year period. So surely you weren't measuring that tree for 150 years. How did you get those numbers? To He's make younger people? than he looks. <laughs> <laughs> what I did, Shelby, was I took trees of those ages in fast growth uh, sites. And I said, okay, you know, here's a fast growth tree in this site. 
how much volume does it have? And I marched them up. So but I, I can pretty well be guaranteed that each of those trees represented a fast growth for the species at that size. Of course, if that one tree at 174 feet, uh, 3 feet in height, uh, I, I couldn't uh, go all the way back to when it was a sapling. So I had to construct through a process called kernel sequencing, the size is going all the way back in the growth rates there. So did I cheat? No, I didn't cheat. I actually <laughs> loaded up early growth more than probably that actual one tree uh, experienced. But you also measured it the last 30 years, right? Yeah. More times than there are grains of sand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is no explanation for that, folks. I mean, we're a little bit crazy. But that's what I do. Uh, John knows that very well. Well, believe my, my mentor, my first mentor, I think he just humored me, but finally he decided, well, you know, maybe there's really something to this ground truthing idea that we go out and we actually. You know, instead of being a, a, a great philosopher and, and discuss what might be in the horse's mouth, we actually open the horse's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Bauer, you must have a question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so in your, in your research, you talked about the uh, sort of Strange thing happened. Uh, the, the, the logging company went out of business, and a group of individuals bought it for you know cents on the on the Australian dollar, and uh, and they just shut down the the logging operation. I mean, it happened overnight, literally. So there's this very sharp. This is a very unusual situation. Very sharp debarkation where <coughs> half of all the lands that were being harvested. Well, you could see they were they were emitting a, a twenty. Uh, 20 million tons of carbon a year, uh, so uh, carbon dioxide a year. Uh, so that's, I have to see what that, what that turned out to be in terms of area. But, uh, and, 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 and in just that short period of time, it was absorbing 22 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. Um, so it's, I mean, Tasmania isn't a huge area. But maybe it's about, I don't know, could be the size of the Adirondacks, maybe, I don't know, as, as a total, total area. And it's mostly it's mostly forested, or it was mostly forested. This Can way. I follow on to Peter's question, which is to say, it seems like it would be easy to incentivize um, in our 
um, northeastern states, it just seems like you could sort of incentivize with the you know quick legislation or something. Um, does it? Is that true? Well, um, you know there is this this idea, and it's actually a practice in some places called payment for ecosystem services. There's also carbon trading. The carbon trading has proven to be quite problematic. Uh, if you think about, uh, if, if I'm going to buy, if somebody's going to buy your carbon offset from you, uh, the trees that you were growing are still growing. The emissions they're doing are still being emitted, and um, over the, the the life of the of the deal, those forests have to remove all the carbon dioxide that keeps coming. But there's no change in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we need to have it going down, right? We have to, we have to put, put less in every year. Uh, and um, secondly, it's just a, quite a scandal. Uh, you know, California has, a, has an offset program, which you know, for a while they allowed, allowed outside areas to buy, you know, to sell offsets uh, for, for emissions in California. And then they, they set that at a limit. I think it's only 8% of their emissions or something can be offsets. Um, and then there were these big fires. I mean, Microsoft lost, I think, $100 million worth of offsets in one of those California fires. So it, it's, it's a difficult thing to do with offsets. Well, I think it's a better deal, better situation is to do payment for ecosystem services. California, of course, is way out in front on that. Uh, they have some, some hydro dams, and the owners of those dams pay uh, watershed land, forest landowners, to keep their forest standing to reduce siltation. Hmm. All right, I know that, that's a good deal. They also, of course, by letting those forests stand, are, are, are absorbing more carbon. They're protecting uh, more uh, biodiversity. They're uh, evaporating more water and cooling the surrounding area. They're just providing a whole range of, of, of benefits. And since we in New York, we do it, and we do it in Massachusetts, we pay people uh, 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 to encourage them, well, we pay them a subsidy if they will put on solar panels or if they'll buy an electric vehicle. Why don't we pay people to let the forest keep growing? But it, but that could require some management, right, to do it right. So um, that's just a, that's, that, I guess I'd say that's my favorite solution for dealing with private landowners. Surveys taken by the Forest Service show that uh, less than half of forest landowners actually want to harvest their land. And they usually do it as a, in a moment, you know, the hospital bill, the kid going to college, uh, that, but that's a once in 50 year benefit. They get paid monthly, a modest amount, but it's a regular payment. They know they're going to get it for know, whatever the deal is, 10 years, 25 years, 50 years, whatever it might be. John? I'd, I'd love to direct this to Bill, but if anybody else wants to weigh in, uh, welcome your thoughts as well. Um, there's a lot of researchers who emphasize substitution effects using wood products instead of more carbon intensive alternatives like cement, reinforced concrete, uh, plastic, things like that. How do you how do you suggest we think about that in, in your way of seeing things? Well, uh, first of all, I think we should be doing doing accurate life cycle calculations on everything. I mean, that's a, I'm really struck by these claims that uh, um, carbon capture and storage from a coal burning power plant is, uh, is, 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 uh, is removing carbon that would otherwise go in the atmosphere. Well, you look, that's a whole life cycle. And it turns out, what are they using it for? They're using the carbon dioxide to push more oil out of the ground and burn it. How do you account for that? Uh, it turns out in the, in the one plant that we had that ran for a year and a half in Texas, the Petronova plant, an analysis done with the real data from that suggested that over, if it runs for 20 years, with all of the energy used to, uh, you know, first of all, you, there's parasitic energy to, to capture that movement, and it's typically 25 or 30 percent. That means you've got to dig 25 or 30 percent more coal in order to do that, and so it goes. So it's, um, there's kind of no free lunch in this, but, but doing the life cycle, I think, is hugely important. And when it comes to is is uh, wood better than uh, than concrete? Absolutely, in the first uh, the first round. But you do have to count those huge amounts of emissions that come from the, what didn't go into the boards, right? And I've yet to see a, an analysis that does that. In the place, absolutely right. You can measure the amount of carbon in the boards, the cross-laminated timber that's in that 12-story building. 
And that's true. But it, it's likely that there was twice as much carbon dioxide emitted in harvesting that forest and, uh, and manufacturing those boards. Just like there's a lot of emissions that come from, from concrete. Uh, the steel industry is a little tricky in the United States because they claim that 95% of the steel they use in construction is recycled steel. So, okay, it's not, there's no, no um, emissions and energy from the smelting of iron ore for that. Um, concrete and steel buildings last a lot longer than wooden buildings. How do you put that in? Um, siding, we, we used uh, something called hardy board, which is a concrete composite material instead of wood because it's much more durable. It is more carbon intensive to make it, but it lasts a lot longer. Uh, those uh, so that siding won't need to be replaced as, as wood siding. In fact, I insisted on having wood trim because I didn't like the look of the uh, synthetic stuff. And within five years, I was having to replace it because it was uh, it was very it turned out it was very wide grained uh, pine, and the, the fungi loved it. it went in the ends. So. It, it's complicated. There is a paper um, uh, that uh, that examines a bunch of these comparisons and finds that uh, that there are a lot of exaggerations uh, when you don't take into account everything. Uh, Mark Harmon is the author of that, and it came out about six years ago or something. Uh, and it's you know you may not agree with him, but he does point out where there are a lot of false assumptions that are made, and you can make your own decision as to how important you think they are. But that's the only real paper I know that has looked at a lot of different things. But and, and there are times when, when wood is going to be more, a better carbon uh, balance than other things, but it's just not automatically the case. Often it's just stated as a fact without doing the math. Do the math, right, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. It's a very important question. So I work with forest pests and pathogens, and of course I love this slide, which is showing you know how much potential forest carbon we can store here in those dark green areas of the map. Um, however, we're facing some pretty increasing threats here. Uh, if we look at the southern Adirondacks, one in four trees is either hemlock or beech, and one of the studies out of Harvard Forest shows that we will pretty much lose hemlock in uh, the Adirondacks by 2050. We'll only keep it in the cold earth pockets by that point. And then beach leaf disease is rapidly spreading its way up the Hudson Valley. Um, and so, do you have any uh, any as you look at those models? How do you also take that into account the fact that um, both on our managed and on our unmanaged lands, we may be losing potentially a quarter of our forests before 2050 due to forest pests and pathogens right here? Right. That's why we have to work extra hard in every way we can to reduce our emissions from all sources and uh, and, and uh, increase uh, the, uh, the, the growth of the trees that we have and will have at that time. I, I just think I just think we have to try harder. Um, it, and we're, we are going to lose a lot. But the, our northeast forests, believe it or not, are less vulnerable than, say, the uh, southeast forests forest are. Uh, and will outlast them. Um, as, if they last longer, that means you're going to remove and store in some form carbon. And even when they're dead, I mean, there's a lot of dead wood in, in our forest, and, and that is carbon that's stored. And for uh, um, Lee was just pointing out that we were out on this, this tour uh, earlier, a couple of days ago, that. Uh, uh, hardwoods uh, release carbon, much of the carbon dioxide, and they decay right into the atmosphere. But the, the conifers, much of it goes into the soil. So, uh, I mean, it is it is complex. But let's study it so we understand it, so we know how to set our priorities. I guess uh, all I can say. Um, you know, it's not it, it it is a grim prospect we're facing in terms of what climate change is doing. Why are we having all these pests? Why is all this getting worse? A lot of it's due to the change in climate. This question is probably directed at Lee. Um, my partner and I just recently purchased about 90 acres of land uh, right on the edge of the Racket Boreal Complex. And there's a sizable chunk of that uh, amazing forest 
where uh, red maple are coming up through and shading out the um, balsam in particular. If we want to keep the boreal nature, does it make sense to thin out that red maple in a forest we otherwise plan to leave pretty much untouched? Yeah, you, you could do that and be like the deer I was talking about that keep the temperate <laughs> seedlings more than the boreal seedlings and you can delay the change then until the climate is so warm that it just directly kills the boreal trees. Yeah, we're, we're seeing red maple spread massively in northern Minnesota as well with a warming climate. Um, it's right at the northern <laughs> end of its range there and you, and you can really see the movement. We had 2,000 plots in the Boundary Waters and every one of them had at least one red maple seedling. And this is a place, you know, that used to be 55 or 60 below zero every winter and there's no way you could have had red maple in other than a few tiny little special places on the landscape that stayed warmer during the winter. Uh, mostly hilltops where the cold air drains off. But yeah, you, the, I would advise you to go ahead and get rid of red maple. I mean, I consider it to be a form of landscape cancer myself. <laughs> so, but you know, so many people who harvest it. That's the next Washington Post headline. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so many, and so many harvests in Minnesota and northern Wisconsin, they cut everything but the red maple because nobody wants the red maple wood. Yeah. Well, if you leave only the red maple as seed trees, what do you think you're going to get 100% of in the next generation? I mean, you just can't manage forests that way where you push it toward the least desirable species. Hmm. Any other questions? Jackie. I, I, I just want a basic one. But first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you for the panel discussion here tonight. It's been absolutely wonderful. And and it made it just exciting and funny, and I appreciate that. Um, mine is a question of, I want to be an injection of hope. Um, have you felt like policymakers are caring more and more about the science that you are doing? Or do you feel like that is, has not been the case? I feel like in New York State, you know, the Young Force Initiative, and there's been a focus on industry rather than on the actual role of trees and forests in the climate fight that's current and ahead of us. And so I'm curious to know what it's like on your front with policymakers. Uh, yeah, there, there are some that care more and more, but I don't think it's happening fast enough. And, and by the way, I co-authored a paper about um, against creating more young forests. Um, there's enough early successional habitats out there without cutting down mature uh, Forests like maple forests, for example, and I think Bill wants to wants to answer that question as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's um. I mean, we, we are in a difficult situation. Uh, in in Massachusetts, we have a new governor and a whole new regime. Uh, one of the things that uh, she did just recently was to put a, a moratorium, not a ban, a moratorium on further harvesting on public lands because if we're going to set aside 30% by 2030 or even by 2050 or whatever, uh, we got to start somewhere. Public lands are, are, I think, where you should start because they do serve the public purposes and you're not then you know, leaning on, on private landowners to say this is what you should do with your land. It's interesting, the backlash, um, I, which I think is mostly symbolic. I mean, it's a symbolic thing. If the state isn't letting, cut, have, is not going to have cutting on their lands for suspending cutting on their lands, that says that they don't respect the industry. That's not true at all. It's basically, it's a moratorium. We're going to find out before we cut things down that will take 100 years to grow back. Let's make a decision. I think that's what's, uh, the other thing that we did in Massachusetts is um, last summer before the new governor came in, uh, there was a lot of pressure to uh, end the, the um, um, bioenergy electricity uh, production, burning, burning wood, burning wood pellets uh, to make electricity. And uh, that passed very strongly in the legislature. It was signed, uh, it was, it was touch and go with the Republican governor, but it finally went through over his veto. And um, and, and we, we also will not give subsidies to 
out of state wood burning that we were doing in the past. Um, that means frees up money to actually do other things that don't emit any, any carbon dioxide at all. Um, so I see those as gains. I see uh, President Biden's uh, request a year ago to uh, inventory all the mature old growth forests on federal, land, federal lands, both the Forest Service and the BLM lands, which was just, that report just came in this past Earth Day. That, that was a symbolism right we in politics, I guess. <laughs> Uh, but it's unclear what's going to be done with that information uh, because um, the Forest Service, for example, um, and the closing uh, previous administration uh, rela relaxed what's called the 21 inch rule, which in the Northwest was you, they did not cut trees larger than 21 inches. Back in the 90s, the spotted owl controversy, the need old growth. And uh, and so that was going to, that's supposedly going to be relaxed. I think it's sort of in suspension. A young scientist contacted me and Beverly Law and Rich Birdsey and a few other people and said, I found a database in the US Forest Service. They measured 763,000 trees in those six national forests on the east side of the, of the, of the Cascades where that rule applies. And we can find out which ones are bigger than 21 inches and, or, or, or the other number is 30 inches. And um, so it's wonderful to work with young people who have the patience to go through those data sets. And what we found was that uh, the number of stems that were over 21 inches was only 3% of the stems, but they held 43% of the carbon. And that's just, it, and, and that turns out not to be unique. There are study after study now coming out just in the last 10 years, finding this disproportionate amount of carbon that's in the largest trees. So big trees, save, save some big trees, and you can cut some smaller ones and it'll be still in positive territory. Uh, so I think those are all signs of progress that we're beginning to think beyond uh, just, just that all forests should be managed for production, right? That's a radical idea, I guess, but it, it really needs to be the case. And then it becomes a political decision as to which forest we maintain for production and which forest we maintain for uh, planetary operations. And still, in the ones we manage for production, there's still ways of doing that better and worse from a climate point of view. So, I mean, there, there are multiple ways we, we, could, we can move towards a better, a better balance. Reverend Bob, you want to send us out on a note of hope? Uh, wow, <laughs> that's a heavy <laughs> Well, the note of hope is that uh, every time I come back from Western Massachusetts to the Adirondacks, I feel I'm coming to a second home and love it and have been coming here for years enjoying the, uh, this remarkable park. Uh, I've traveled in all 50 states. I'm a retired Air Force uh, person and traveled the world, went around the world, saw many forests, and I simply marvel at what's here and the value that it has. And um, I, I'm honored to be a part of anything that helps. And uh, is, that, is that good enough? That's good. <laughs> Thanks for hosting.